Good evening. This is Ted Houston greeting you from station WRGB in Schenectady, New York. Wonderful thing, television. Is he really doing that? Of course, Aunt Emily. You mean, uh, taint a movie? No. Rubbish. Yes. Tonight, instead of our usual tuning quiz show, WRGB will televise a motion picture on television itself. Television, the very same medium of communication by which my image is coming to you now. This film, most of which was made in our own studios, was produced in response to many of your requests asking for information on television and how it works. We hope you'll all know in a general way before the evening is over. Fade out one. Fade in three. Okay, the movie's on the air. See, I told you. The man said so himself. It's a movie now, yes. But the movie's been televised. It's coming to us over the air like radio. George Fulham, let me smell your breath. Man is a curious, prying creature. Since the very beginning of history, he has been trying to peer into the obscure, creating the tools which permit him to snoop more successfully for his knowledge and pleasure. He wanted to find out about the stars and their movements, so he invented the telescope. He wanted to study the composition of materials, to see the germ in close-up, so he developed the microscope. He wanted to listen in on distant sounds, to pass along information. So he built more devices, the telephone, the telegraph, the radio. Without budging more than a few blocks, he wanted to see far off places, distant people in action. So the motion picture camera made its appearance. But these were not enough, in spite of the fact that he could see and hear a duplication of something that had already happened elsewhere, a talking picture of a past event, in spite of the fact that in his own home, he could hear words, sound and music from great distances the very moment they were being produced, still he was not satisfied. He wanted to go sightseeing at home. By his own fireside, he wanted to see as well as hear what is happening now someplace else. So, television was devised. Aside from broadcasting sound, television, you know, simply consists of taking pictures and sending those pictures out over the air at the same time. As you might expect, a camera is used for the photography, just as in any other kind of picture taking. Only there's no film in the television camera. Developing film and printing pictures takes too long. Besides, you can't broadcast paper pictures. You can, however, broadcast electrical pictures, and those are the kind that the television camera takes. Behind the lens of the camera is a special plate in a glass tube one of the great developments in the promising science of electronics. This plate is a fascinating device. It's completely covered with millions of tiny electric eyes, which of course are sensitive to light. When light strikes them, they become charged with electricity, and the amount of electricity they develop depends upon the amount of light striking them. The more light, the greater the electric charge. Now, any scene is made up of various points of light and shadow. Some sections are light, some dark, some are in between. Here, for example, the jackets are lighter than the trousers, so naturally they create greater charges of electricity on the plate than the trousers do. All the shading and details of a scene are reproduced the same way. The electric eyes see the various differences in light levels and develop electric charges to match them. Combined, these charges form electric pictures of the scene, which are sent out immediately. Each picture does not go out all at once, however, as a snapshot might through the mail. Like a telegraph message, it's sent bit by bit, arriving at the receiver's piecemeal. The charge in each electric eye becomes an electric impulse and dashes merrily away by itself, the other impulses following in single file, one after the other. As they reach a receiver, they strike the screen in order 
and are transformed back into points of light and shadow. Of course, the process is much faster than you see it here. It has to be to keep you from noticing the mechanics of it, to keep up with any action in the scene, and to give the illusion of motion. We've just slowed it down so you could see how it's done. Now we'll speed it up. 30 complete pictures go out every second in the form of single electric impulses. And every second, four million impulses reach the receiver screen one after the other. It sounds unreasonable, I know, but it's quite true. As the charges are removed from the plate, the electric impulses dash from the camera to the control room through a special cable. Here, great pains are taken to keep them from getting muddled or out of proportion and to prevent any interference. The impulses are very weak at this point, so the engineers strengthen them through electronic tubes, like the tubes in your radio, to make them powerful enough to send over the air. Outside, they rush up a towering antenna and are released in the form of an extremely short radio wave, aimed directly for the transmitter. The transmitter, which acts as a link between the studio and the television audience, is always at a high altitude. This is because the distance over which television programs can be received satisfactorily is usually limited to the area between the top of the transmitter and the horizon. The higher the transmitter, the more distant the horizon and the greater the area reached. This site in the Helderberg Hills a few miles from Albany, New York is a particularly good one. Within the horizon lies the entire New York State Capital District, so it's easy for people in Albany, Troy, Schenectady, and nearby towns and villages to tune in the programs. So much for that. Now for a trip to the relay station, a first and major step in the establishment of practical television networks. Because this station is at a still higher altitude and practically free from any noise or other interference, it manages to receive programs which are broadcast from New York City, 129 miles away, even though it is somewhat below the horizon, as seen from the top of the Empire State Building. As the station receives these programs from New York, it relays them to a receiving antenna at the transmitter, which, as you will notice, is within the horizon as seen from the relay. At the transmitter, they are given greater power and rebroadcast all over the Capital District, completing the network, the first television network in history. It is here in the transmitter, while final checkups are being made, that all programs, from New York or otherwise, are at last released to the various television home receivers in and around the district. If you've never seen a television screen in the raw, this is what it looks like. Actually, it's part of a large glass tube developed in the wondrous electronic laboratories. The end of the tube is frosted on the inside with a sensitive chemical, the same type of chemical that is used in fluorescent lamps. This chemical backing, which forms the screen, is unusually sensitive to electric charges and will glow in response to them. So whenever television signals reach the tube, the screen gives off light, and the amount of light it gives off depends on the strength of the electric impulses. Striking the chemical screen in order, the impulses are transformed back into the same points of light and shadow that make up the scene in front of the camera, and our electric pictures become visible. The whole process, from camera to receiver, seems to take a lot of time and trouble, doesn't it? Yet, in spite of the complications, in spite of the distance, we see whatever is being televised almost instantaneously. The television studio itself is more like a motion picture studio than a radio station. At WRGB, you will not only find air conditioning, soundproof walls, control rooms, and the usual microphones, but scenery, cameras, furniture, properties, and a host of powerful lighting units. These lights are all water-cooled to eliminate unnecessary heat and maintain comfortable working conditions. The ones in the ceiling were specially designed and are governed from a control desk. At the flip of a switch, each unit can be silently tipped or turned around to concentrate light exactly where it's needed. One section of the building is devoted to movies. Since studio programs require most of the detailed preparation needed for a stage play, 
Enough of them cannot be produced to fill all the scheduled time. Consequently, movies are one of the three major program divisions, doing for television what recordings or transcriptions do for radio. This equipment is also used for still photographs, maps, and titles occasionally. In the third division of programming, televising special events lies a great future, for it has all the merits of the motion picture newsreel and more. Everything from feeding the seals in the zoo to a complete World Series or the Kentucky Derby may be seen by our very own firesides while they're actually happening. We can see the distant present, not just a photographic record of the past. A mobile unit like this is nothing more than a television station on wheels. After being driven to the scene of action and set up for the broadcast, it relays both sight and sound directly to the transmitter from a collapsible antenna. The method of broadcasting is the same as for any other type of program. Now let's return to the studio floor for a backstage glimpse of what goes on there during a program. Never mind the wine, where for luck and level ranks, and therefore though his lordship stations mighty though stupendous be his brain, for her taste are mean and flighty, and her fortune's poor and fair. The sound, of course, is picked up by microphones and is being sent out along with the picture signals. Ring the merry bells and fortune friendly ever warbling wan for the union of my lordship with a humble captain's child. For a humble captain's child. On these monitors, the director can see what each camera is picking up. The center screen shows what is being sent out over the air. The director decides which scene shall be sent out over the air. Take one. Changing from one camera to another adds variety to the picture. To further relieve any possible monotony, both cameras are movable so that the show can be seen from various angles and distances. Two, dolly into a big close-up of Josephine. Notice that the cameramen wear headphones to receive instructions from the program director. And the Lord who rules the water. The sets against the far wall were used in an earlier part of the program. With such an arrangement, it's possible to switch from an interior to an exterior setting in a few minutes. The cameras and the lights have only to turn from one set to another. Unlike the stage, there is seldom any need for intermission. Amazing, isn't it? that this same program is being watched and heard in hundreds of homes at this very moment. Never mind the why and where for luck and never ranks and therefore I admit the jurisdiction every time you played your part you have carried from conviction to my hesitating heart. Ring the merry bells and watch a friend the air with warbling wife for the young moon of my lordship with a humble captain's child. For a humble captain's Could anything be more miraculous Hardly. Yes, television is now a practical reality for many of us to enjoy. And man's dream of sightseeing at home has at last come true. And that concludes the program for today. We'll be on the air again tomorrow evening at 8.15. This is Ted Houston and WRGB wishing you all good night. <laughs>